when I started working in this area, only 16 patients' uh, blood clots had, had been studied and published histologically. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 155 of the Stroke Cast. Let's learn about blood clots. This week's episode is brought to you by the fine folks at Modus Nova. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. And by the fine folks at Like Minded. To find out if Like Minded can help you live your best post-stroke life, visit strokecast.com slash Like Minded. More than 80% of strokes, including mine, are caused by a clot that blocks blood flow to part of the brain. What exactly is a clot? Michael Gilvari and Dr. Patrick Brower from Saranovas, a Johnson & Johnson company, join us this week to talk clots. What they are, what they're made of, and what's involved in pulling them out to restore blood flow in the brain. So now, let's meet Michael and Patrick and learn some science. So, Patrick and Michael, thanks so much for joining us on the show this week. Pleasure, Bill. Thank you for uh, inviting us. Thank you for having us. This is really exciting for me because I really like getting into some of the details of this stuff that people don't normally encounter. What I like to say is that I, I don't offer medical advice on this show. I am not a doctor. I'm just a marketing guy who knows way more about neurology and neuroplasticity than any marketing guy should ever know. So this stuff is just really interesting to me and I think really interesting to our audience, too. What the data shows us is that more than 80% of those of us who have joined the Stroke Club have done so thanks to a blood clot in the brain of some sort. So what we, we know is we kind of know that a clot is going to stop blood. And we might know that a clot is what happens when you skin your knee. But what exactly is a blood clot? Well, Bill, I think that's a very nice question. And um uh, first of all, I want to just address what you just said. Um, we can only give generalized information. So uh, also the things that I say are for generalized public and is not really pertaining to any individual patient. Absolutely. I always I always like to remind folks that this is just for general inter information and entertainment purposes. Do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal medical team. Exactly. I heard your disclaimer, and I, I think that's absolutely uh, very important for the patient to know. But uh, like I said, I, I like the question that you asked, uh, what, what is a blood clot? Because that's basically what Cyrenovus is, uh, uh, is looking into. Uh, so as, as most people know, clot is something that we need to have, because if you cut your finger, you basically want the, blood, the bleeding to stop. And uh, clot is obviously trying to prevent this leaking from happening. The, the problem with blood clots happening in a blood vessel is that it will occlude the blood vessel that is, for example, feeding the brain. And that's where we call it a, a stroke, uh, a brain stroke. And this occlusion is caused by a blood clot. Uh, and most of the time, if you have that, there is no real perfusion to the brain, which basically means that there is not oxygen or nutrients going to the brain. And with all uh, uh, forms of starvation, that's a problem. So the, the tissue will be wasting away and eventually dying. And depending on how much oxygen or nutrients are needed for that particular part of the brain, it may take more or less time for actually the brain tissue to be damaged. Um, sometimes that's a matter of minutes or seconds, and sometimes that may be up to hours. But like I said, Going back to the point what Cyrenovus is about, we, we, we try to understand clot, and I think that, that Michael can really give you some uh, some insight into that. Yeah, and I, I think I would add, uh, I'd double down on the caution that I'm an engineer by training, so um, not a physician. And But, but I guess... So, so as, a, as a marketing guy, I'm one of those people who really makes the engineering people's lives really hard. Well, uh, 
<laughs> do, do, do my best uh, to, to try and, um, I guess, explain, you know, the research that, that we've been doing in Terra Nova to try and understand blood clots and then how we use that to, to develop our devices. Because I started working in this area over 10 years ago and what, what kind of really struck me at the start actually is how little data there was published on on actually what's happening inside the blood vessel um, during a stroke. And as we kind of set off on our journey to develop a mechanical thrombectomy device for the removal of the blood clot, you know, we felt it was really important to try and understand the the physical properties of, of the clot, what's, what the vessels are, are like, um, the flow dynamics in, inside the vessel. One of the things, you know, that we've done is really tried to replicate on bench models actually what's happening you know when somebody unfortunately develops a stroke when their vessel becomes occluded what we try to do is is just replicate that event and and try to understand actually what's happening within the vessel using different blood blood clot types and then we use that um to to inform our decision making essentially as, as we're developing devices what it sounds like you're doing then is you're figuring out how you can simulate a clot on the bench, meaning in in the lab, someplace where you're going to experiment on it. Because once you can simulate a clot, which means you have to understand the different types of clots, then you can start testing gear to remove that clot in an environment that is supposed to represent a human without actually testing or putting humans at risk. And you want to be able to repeat it as much as possible to get the best results. That's it. it. It's a really safe environment to, to experiment. Over the years, what we've done is found a very nice intersection point, really, where, where science meets engineering meets medicine. When, when you've got a model that sh- you can replicate a stroke in, in, a, in a bench, that sh- it, it has multiple benefits, trying to observe uh, what's happening for, for different clot types. To, to do that, actually, we've made a pretty big effort to try and fit, fit out the, the number of blood clots that that, were, that have been studied. And we've done this through collaborations right across the globe with uh, different uh, academic institutes and, and physicians who are interested in, in studying this. And it, it actually, remarkably, when I started working in this area, only 16 patients' uh, blood clots had, had been studied and published histologically. So there was very little data out there at that time. And to, in, in, in the years since then, there's several thousand uh, pa- patients clots studied and, and published in the literature. So there's really been a very strong tide of research that has happened over the last number of years that has really helped to to inform the, these types of models that we're talking about. Well, I think it's it, it's great that we're getting that research and we're starting to understand more of this. So as you've been going through this research and looking at these different patients' clots, what are some of the the differences you're seeing among the clots? Because I think most of us just think of a clot as as just a single type of thing, but it sounds like there are going to be different types. So, you know, how do those differences manifest? Yeah, they're, they're, they manifest different physical properties, but I, I'll maybe invite Patrick to come in first and maybe talk about, you know, clinically um, how, they, how they're different. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Yeah, indeed, there is there is a difference in how clots behave in in a patient. Like I said, if you have a cut in your finger, then um, uh, the clot needs to be built, and usually you call it a thrombus if it is a buildup of clot uh, based on a specific underlying cause. And that can be irregular irregularity of the vessel wall. If you have atherosclerosis, for example, or plaque, as they call it as well, then sometimes you have a buildup of all kinds of uh, constituents that we call a thrombus. But these thrombuses can occlude a blood vessel if they become too large, and then they occlude a vessel. But what sometimes also happens is that they break off and uh, actually go with the blood flow to an area 
uh, downstream where the blood vessels get smaller and smaller and then they just get lodged into dislodged into one of those arteries and then they block it and that's when we call it an embolism so an embolism is actually um, something that happens uh, distal so you have a clot somewhere in the blood system in the vascular system and it breaks off and it moves with the uh, uh, blood flow to uh, to a portion more downstream whereas a thrombus uh, that can occlude just because it's building up over time and gradually it's uh, decreasing the size of the uh, blood vessel and basically occludes it and that's something that has been studied in the model as well. Just, just to clarify, so if it's if it's if it builds in place and stays in place, it's a thrombus. Once that thrombus breaks off for whatever reason and travels someplace else, that's when we call it an embolism. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'm not a native speaker, so I'm sorry that I need a lot of words to explain. But I'm happy no, that you nobody got it. here yes. is a native speaker of medical and science speak. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And it's it's um, you know as part of the, the research, but then you know we would have worked with physicians to try and and collect clots, and and the standard analysis that's done on them is is histology. So the clots can be looked at. Uh, after after applying various stains to to look at the constituent components, um, which include red cells, uh, fibrin, white cells, platelets, um, and indeed other connective tissues from from time to time as well. And again, as as an engineer, you know, I I probably think of clots as physical material that that has properties, and those properties vary from, you know, being being very soft. Uh, Kind of a fresh clot, and and those might have a high red cell composition, for example. Um, some of them, depending on the conditions they're formed in, if they're they're formed in high shear conditions, for example, they, they might have more fibrin. And fibrin is it's like it sounds, it's like a fiber um, that that's you know almost forms a, a very strong mesh inside the clot, and and that ratio of of red cells to fibrin, for example, it's probably the most basic way that you can vary clot properties and and the implications there are it, it you know starts off maybe being being really soft as if it's got a high red cell content um and then either through forming in different conditions or or maybe through aging and maturing um they, they can become much firmer um and you know those physical physical properties then they can first of all um, we've done some interesting studies on the model where, where we introduce different clock compositions and you know what you observe actually is is a different occlusion forming based on on the clock composition and the clot size during the event of a stroke that means it can maybe go to a different vessel or more distally or more proximally in a vessel but but also those properties then become really important when the, when we think about removing the, the clot from the vessel it sounds like almost one way to think about it is, you know, if we use sort of our skin as an analogy, our really soft skin that's always covered up and always protected is going to be a lot softer. But the stuff that's exposed to the weather and real life, like the palms of our hands, the bottoms of our feet, that's going to be the stuff that's going to be a lot tougher. And when we start talking about soft clots versus more fibrous clots, it almost seems like that is sort of an analogy or a parallel that might make sense to folks. I, I think, you know, generally speaking, when a clot, for example, for, forms in stasis, and we, we do this on the bench all the time, we can take blood, put it into a test tube, essentially. And, and what you can observe, actually, and we've done a, an interesting study on this, when you put a high platelet uh, concentration in there, um, the platelets almost act internally inside the solid material in the clot, and, and they actually pull on the on the f fibrin fibers, and they, they kind of tighten up the clot. So it starts off as you know maybe a full test tube of it looks like it's it's blood clot, and then you know thirty minutes later, because of the action of the platelets, it might only be half the size that, that it started out on. And, you know, I, I think this is the natural kind of healing process. You know, we talk about cutting our fingers, but, but I think the, the role blood has, and Patrick can probably describe this much more accurately than I can, but, 
the way I think about it is that the first job of a clot is to it's for hemostasis, so it is to stop the, the 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 body from bleeding out, and then over time it's to to heal, and then you know it kind of stabilizes the clot, it tightens it up, and and eventually all these other biochemical processes happen where there's different uh, components kind of recruited to the clot and it, it eventually you know completely heals and um, if it's if it's your skin that's cut for example you know collagen eventually gets gets recruited to that site and and it completely heals so you, you know it's obviously different when it happens in a blood vessel um, but that kind of you know there are changes that, that happen to the clot over time as well we can think of it sort of like what we see in in Star Trek or any places where there's like big battles or something. Once a ship gets damaged and the hull gets breached, the first thing you need to do, you need to get your shields up. You need to close that opening, whatever means necessary, seal it off. Then you can slowly start building it up, building repairs and doing that sort of stuff. And it's weeks later, you may get down to laying down the new carpet because it's a process you take care of the initial crisis first which in the case of an injury to the body is the blood that is trying to leave the body in a way it's not supposed to i do like your analogies bill i honestly think that this is a good description of what is happening yeah indeed and the funny thing is and that's also why it's so interesting that we are studying it within Cyrenovas these these blood clots because there are different types like you said it's the shielding if there is a damage but there is also blood clotting happening inside a blood vessel for example if somebody has a stent in placed uh, implanted in in their coronary arteries or if they have a pacemaker lead uh, that's uh, running through a blood vessel then obviously the blood is going to respond to this foreign body um, and cover that foreign body and that can lead to clot buildup as well but at the same time people with varicose veins um, they can have turbulence of blood happening in their in their veins in their lower leg and this this turbulence can also be a trigger for blood clot formation and all those blood clot types have just different uh, consistencies and some are more fibrin rich or some over time get more fibrin rich and more organized and for example one of the diseases that is really associated with uh, with uh, uh, cerebral stroke is the atrial fibrillation so if if you have that problem with your heart there is turbulence in your heart happening because the contractions are not uh, perfectly uh, aligned and because of that there is uh, clot buildup and that can remain at that place for a long time and really become organized but when it did dislodges then obviously the first way it goes is with the blood flow to the brain so uh, these are really interesting process to processes to understand how does the clot uh, form what does it do over time and how does it behave once it gets uh, uh, dislodged and and uh, is somewhere in a distal vessel and that's exactly what what uh, michael's group is uh, is working on one of the um, very nice publications on this uh, came from UCLA in 2006, uh, where they described different occlusion shapes. So obviously there's a very complex network of arteries in the brain that can become occluded. And in that, in that publication, it's the first one that I mentioned where they, they, they published histology on blood clots, but they also sketched the occlusions the shape of the occlusions and in some instances it's just blocking a single vessel and and in other instances it's blocking a branch so the, the clot is actually going into both branches of, of a bifurcation as well as blocking the main vessel and you know one of the things we kind of wondered when we saw that first is well how, how does that happen it can it happen from a single embolic event or is it necessary that there is in-vessel thrombosis happening to form that, that Y-shape occlusion? And and what we found when we started experimenting with uh, different clot compositions and clot sizes is that you, you can actually get both branches blocked by a single embolic event. If, um, you know, for, for example, if the clot is, is a long, you know, snake-like clot, uh, you put in a really long stringy clot, 
the flow can actually take that in into one branch first and then the clot actually folds and then it, it folds up on itself and you do end up with a very niche kind of a Y-shaped occlusion. Or indeed, if the clot, you know, it could be a big, big lump of clot that um, because it's soft, it gets kind of pushed down into the vessel. And again, all of this com- comes back for us in Sarah Novus, kind of thinking about, well, how do we remove these these clots? But it was just extremely informative to kind of take what had been published in the literature, bring that in into these benchtop models. And, you know, we, we successfully replicated what, what had been reported in the literature around these different occlusion types. Mm, that's great. Being able to replicate it means that we can test it and we can try to figure out how to treat it. So I think a lot of that, uh, and of course the work you're doing at Saranovus, a lot of it comes down to how do we treat then patients in an acute setting when somebody shows up in the ER. So I guess the first thing to understand then is we're talking about these different types of clots. Is there a way right now for a neurointerventionist to identify the type of clot that's causing problems for the patient, or is is that just not something that they're going to be worrying about in that that first thirty minutes when somebody shows up in the ER? Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually, I don't think that in the field there is a consensus uh, amongst us uh, physicians on on how to discern one from another and how relevant it is. I think that uh, what we have seen so far is that some physicians just want to go with their first line of treatment anyway, and no matter what type of clot it is. And there's also a subgroup of uh, physicians that actually want to go uh, with a tailored technique to be sure that you get it out in the, the first attempt. What we know so far is that we have defined difficult clots, so clots that are difficult to remove. We have defined them as clots that are uh, not coming out with one attempt or two attempts or sometimes even three attempts. So that's based on the experience. You don't know that beforehand. We are trying to find out if there is imaging that can help us. So CT scan or MRI scanning, whether there are kind of pointers that already point out whether it's a typical difficult clot and whether you should try a a different approach uh, to start with. And then obviously, if we get the clot out, we will do histology, but that's also after the fact. So we, we try to find maybe with artificial intelligence, a way to to study all the parameters that we know of to predict what kind of clot it may be. And uh, the fourth factor that is really important is sometimes the comorbidity. So if you know that a patient has oncological disease or has atrial fibrillation but is not treated with medication, then the chances of it being a fibrin clot and therefore a clot that is more difficult to remove is way higher. Yeah, and that that would certainly be helpful. I think one of the things that we hear that we know now and that gets talked about a lot is that the current gold standard uh, for treatment of an ischemic stroke in the short term is combination of TPA and mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, TPA being clot buster medication to break it down, mechanical thrombectomy being the surgical procedure to go through the uh, vessels in the groin up into the brain and to remove the clot. Does the, then the type of clot determine whether one or the other of these approaches is going to be optimal? Yeah, that, that also in that field, there's a lot of research going on, um, especially with the clot busting medicine. We know that it's not going to be very active if the clot is, for example, longer than eight millimeters. But also if the clot is really organized, if it's an old clot, then we know that it will take a lot of time before RTPA or whatever clot busting medication you get will actually have an effect. Furthermore, the clot busting medication has to get to the clot. So if there's an occlusion and the flow is basically uh, hindered, the, the clot buster medication is not going through the blood flow to the place where the clot is. So if you want to dissolve a blood clot, the medication has to get there. But if you have stasis because of the occlusion, then obviously there's no medication getting there. 
Then again, we see in studies now that there is sometimes a benefit of having this medication on board. So when you do a thrombectomy and you might lose some tiny fragments, maybe this medication can help in dissolving this um, uh, when it's getting more distal into the uh, uh, peripheral blood vessels. And, and while what, what we don't uh, you know, make TPA ourselves, it is interesting for us to study the, the what TPA actually does to the clot. And again, we, we've replicated that on the bench because t- TPA actually acts on the fibrin portion of the clot. And it's, I, I guess, ironically, clots that are much higher in fibrin comp- composition are less susceptible to TPA simply because there's, there's more of it there. Um, and we, we've published some of this work as well. But what we found is that the, the clots that are higher in red cells actually are much more susceptible to, to TPA. And the, the hypothesis behind that is because there's there's less um, there's less fibrin to to act on. And, you know, I think a lot of these patients in terms of treatment path, even if they have mechanical thrombectomy, pretty high portion of them will have received uh, t- TPA in advance. So that could be, even if it hasn't fully dissolved the clot, it, it could have been acting on the clot in, in some way prior to the, the thrombectomy procedure. So that makes a lot of sense because not to say that administering TPA is a simple thing. Obviously, you have to be professionals and manage that under the guidance of the neurointerventionist and all of that. But ultimately, it's a lot. There's a lot more people and resources available to quickly get TPA into a patient versus the sheer level of hardware and skill it requires to actually do a mechanical thrombectomy. Yeah, that's absolutely correct, and uh, it's nice that you bring it up. It's it's also one of the things that the um, the field of neurointerventionists, uh, with with all the uh, societies around the world, have uh, looked into. Because indeed, if you if you are giving clot bust medication, this can be done by basically the trainee or the nurse or uh, the professor. It doesn't make a difference who is administering the drug. Obviously, the decision to give it is something else, but who is administering it doesn't make a difference. Thrombectomy is a surgical procedure, so it does make a difference who is doing the procedure. And that's also why it's imminent, uh, imminent that these these people that are trained for these treatments, that they are the ones doing it. It is something that, that you need skills for. And the funny thing that you see nowadays is that devices work basically on all clot types, but each clot type has a a different challenge. And I I think that Michael has some background studies that uh, that can nicely illustrate that. Yeah, yeah. so again, I I think of clot as a physical material um, that, you know, needs to be removed from from the blood vessel. And as as we develop and design our devices in Cerenovus, you know, the goal is to develop devices that, that can effectively remove all clot types and in in fact you know clots are often heterogeneous so that they've got different portions of, of different factors rarely you see a, a, a very uniform homogeneous clot, clot composition um so so the devices that we develop have to deal with all with all clot types and there are two general approaches um one is is using aspiration the other is, is using stent retrievers and Indeed, you know, combined approaches is used quite often as well. Um, but but it, it, it's really through an understanding of how these clots can behave uh, when you put them in contact with any vessel or, or any device type, how the clot itself is going to respond is really important to understand. Um, so, for example, if it's a really soft, friable clot, you know, it's, it's important to try and think about how a device might prevent that from from either prevent it from breaking up or indeed if it does break up how to retrieve the the entire clot from the vessel and there are different devices that you know can can, can deal with that through either the the construction of, of a stent retriever device as, as we have done with the Embatrap device or using a combination of for example a, a balloon guide in the carotid artery which will occlude the flow in the carotid as the clot is, is being retrieved. The, I, I like to talk about extremes when it comes to 
plot types, but obviously every, everything in between happens as well. But the, the other extreme is these really tough, vibrant plots, and they present a completely different cha- challenge to, to removal because they're almost like a piece of chewing gum or a tough piece of chewing gum. So, so you know, a stent retriever device, for example, um, doesn't embed in itself in the same way. And that's why the, the overall architecture of, of the stent retriever is, is really important. And again, you know, during the procedure, uh, there, there are certain techniques that can be used by u- using a combination of, of aspiration or stent retriever or even aspiration alone in, in some instances, um, depending on the technique, uh, some physicians f- find that useful for, for different uh, clot types. When these uh, models, bench models, are available to physicians, it's, it's actually very easy to visualize how the devices and the clot interact with, with each other because during an intervention, it's all under X-ray and it, it's not possible to see to see the clot itself. So, so the models can be quite informative in describing what's happening between the, the device and, and the clot as it's been removed. Uh, so if a clot is not dealt with, for example, in my case, I was a wake-up stroke in 2017. So before they extended the windows on thrombectomy and TPA beyond like the three hours. So I, I get to the hospital and they're like, nope, let's hope it doesn't get worse. So does that mean, so what happens to that clot that was in my right middle cerebral artery, killing my, uh, starving my basal ganglia? Does that mean that clot is still there? Or how long does that clot stay in that blood vessel before going away on its own or, or or sort of what happens when we don't retrieve it or break it up with clot busters? Yeah, this is a really good question, Bill. And um, it's, it's really difficult, uh, even although I know your basal ganglia are the warm parts uh, of the brain that are hurt, um, to, to be really specific about how that how that works and what what is remains of the clot. The only thing I can can say is that if you have an infarct in your basal ganglia, such as you have, then most of the time it's because of the lenticular striate artery, so really small side branches from the middle cerebral artery, uh, that they are occluded. And if they are, then they are really uh, filled with clot and it cannot be diluted because there's no way out on the other side. The majority of the brain vessels have uh, a collateral network that basically takes care of problems. If there is an occlusion, then some other branches can take over. But particularly in the basal ganglia, that's something that doesn't happen. So if a, a vessel is occluded, it is just occluded. And since these vessels are so tiny, they are uh, smaller than than uh, a millimeter in diameter, then obviously you cannot get there with a device to get the clot out. Um, and like I said before, if there is already stasis in this blood vessel, then uh, you won't be able to uh, to get the medication there. You can see it as a river that is dry because of something that happened uh, uh, downstream. Um, then if you want to go there with a boat to solve the problem downstream, you won't be able to get there because the water is not flowing, so you won't be able to get there. Um, and that's with the medication as well. What happens to those blood vessels that are filled with, with blood clots? Basically, they will, uh, like Michael said, what happened with the test tubes with platelets in there, the clot will retract and basically make the wall of the artery fall together, so they will end up as fibrin strands. If there is no recanalization within a certain amount of time, they will just die off and stay as, uh, as uh, strands, fibrin strands. If there is recanalization, and that happens sometimes in the really large vessels like the carotid artery that uh, runs in the neck, uh, if that's occluded, sometimes it opens up again after a month or, uh, or three, and then it can restore the, the blood flow. But it's highly dependent on the, the territory that lies behind it and how that still asks for reperfusion. The clot is really a biological tissue that is um, uh, active and takes time to take its final form. But in a blood vessel that's totally occluded, you can just uh, uh, assume that it will be occluded forever. Interesting. So that clot essentially becomes part of 
that blood vessel and the downstream part of it just doesn't refill. That's in, in the really tiny ones. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it. It is very interesting. Everything that happens uh, with the vasculature in the brain, it's uh, it's typically why I wanted to go into this field. It is very interesting to see, and there's so much that we don't understand yet, and that's exactly the reason why we need basic research and uh, combine all fields, whether it's the bench stop testing to the histology to the imaging to the treatments. Uh, all of that needs to get together, and then you get a body of evidence and you start understanding what's actually going on there. Uh, after stroke, people are generally going to be on, are on ischemic stroke. People are often put on an antiplatelet medication like Plavix or aspirin. And, you know, personally, I happen to be on, on, on team Plavix. Or they're put on an anticoagulants like uh, Coumadin or Azarelto. And both types of these medications, whether it's antiplatelet or anticoagulant, are designed to stop uh, clots from blocking blood vessels. But, I mean, what's the difference between the two, between the mechanism of the two, of the antiplatelet versus the anticoagulant? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it's not easy to answer. I always use one rule of thumb. Um, if it is to prevent clot from forming in a turbulent environment, such as varicose veins or um, uh, AFib, then you use medications such as heparin or coumadin. If you want to prevent clot from forming on a surface, such as a, a plaque or an implanted device, then the antiplatelet medication is what is uh, usually used. Then again, if you don't find an underlying cause, then most of the time they refer to antiplatelet medication as well because the anticoagulant medication is really difficult to uh, um, uh, to manage. You basically have to monitor the patient almost every week, take a blood sample, see how the levels are, and then you do a prediction of what kind of medication is needed for the next week. Um, that is pretty difficult to do, and that's why antiplatelets are uh, taken over the field. Then again, there's the new kinds of drugs that's called the novel oral anticoagulant drugs, or the NOAX. These are way easier to dose, and some of them can actually be reversed as well if there would be a bleeding problem. So if somebody cuts his finger and is on these drugs, then obviously it will not stop bleeding. But fortunately, we now have medication that can actually work against that as well. So there, there's a large number of uh, clotting medication or anti-clotting medication. And uh, for each patient, it's really uh, tailored. So the physician really has to decide on a number of factors what is the best drug for a particular patient. And actually, there, there, there was a... Uh, 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 a study done that uh, that uh, involved our devices, uh, um, and that's the excellent study. And I know that that Michael looked into that as well, and that also had something to do with uh, with these medications, right, Michael? Yes. So I described, um, you know, the ob observations that we had in when you when you form a clot in a test tube, for example, how it contracts and the action of of platelets. Um, how it kind of tightens up up the clot, for want of a better word, and that that was one thing that we were interested in in looking at. Or the, the principal investigators of the excellent study with their Embotrap device were interested to see would, would um, the presence of platelets in a blood clot modify either the clinical outcome or or the procedural outcome, and this was presented. About a week and a half ago at ISC, which is the International Stroke Conference, and it, it was the first time you know that there was an association made between um, good good outcomes, good clinical outcomes, and mortality, and the clock composition. So, so what the study found is that the, the higher platelet concentration in the red cell rich clots. Um, were associated with worse clinical outcomes and higher mortality rates than, than red cells, red clots that are low on platelets. So, so, so that was a new finding. It was very interesting. Traditionally, we'd seen 
the less red cell clots, more difficult to, to recanalize. So I, I think this is a very new, interesting finding for, from that study. Yeah, it really shows that the platelets have a very active role here. And it also shows why uh, antiplatelet medication can have uh, a beneficial effect, especially if you know that recurrent strokes is something that happens if you don't prevent people with medication. So in that sense, it does make sense to uh, uh, use antiplatelet medication. And, and of course, Seronovus as a brand is something that, uh, I mean, most folks outside of the medical community have probably never heard of. And yet many folks in the Stroke Club have had your devices in our bodies. Uh, so we've been talking about some of these devices. So, so what exactly does Seronovus do? What are the, the sort of the core devices we're talking about here? Yes, yeah, so, so Seronovus is, well, it's, it's part of the Johnson & Johnson medical device companies. And it provides devices for the endovascular treatment of, of both hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke. Um, so, so hemorrhagic stroke is, is it occurs when, when an aneurysm ruptures, for example. But Cernovus provide devices that are used to, to treat those aneurysms. Um, and I guess her focus more recently has been on what we've just been talking about. It's, it's on ischemic stroke because ischemic stroke has uh, seen a huge change in terms of treatment options. It's only seven years ago since mechanical thrombectomy was was accepted as, as a standard of care in, in stroke treatment. So it's really been our focus to try and get a deep understanding of, of this disease, understand the pathology and use that to, to develop devices. And we're doing that at a at a pretty quick rate, but I think ultimately, you know, patients are, are, are going to benefit uh, from, from all this work. So when we're talking about these different devices that you're you're bringing to market, I think you mentioned a couple of different technologies earlier, and we're talking about retrievers and balloons and things like that. I mean, I, I think a lot of us, we can think about this as, uh, you know, we're running the thing up through the uh, through the the vascular system to pull the clot out. What are then some of the differences in the devices that you're bringing to market that a physician might choose to to use? So, so the you know I, I guess uh, we talk about you know time time is brain when it comes to st stroke treatment because it's not just you know the, the fast campaign getting patients to hospital quickly, but but it's also when they that they're actually in the procedure being able to get get the devices into the brain as quickly as possible and, and also removing the blood clot as, as quickly and as efficiently as, as possible. Um, so all of our, our device development effort is, is focused on really those two things, making the procedure quick and easy, as easy to use as possible for the physician as, as well as um, effectively re removing the blood clots. So, so there, there's a series of catheters that are used. They're typically inserted through the femoral artery. The devices have to navigate around the aortic arch uh, if it's an anterior stroke into the carotid artery. So, so there's typically a larger catheter um, to do that. Sometimes it's, it's, it's a balloon guide catheter, which can be used to include flow later in the procedure. And, and then, depending on the preferred technique, sometimes it's it's a direct aspiration approach, which is a, quite a large catheter relative to the vessel size, but it's extremely trackable. It has to navigate, you know, st still still through th those delicate vessels uh, to reach the blood clot. Um, so sometimes that direct aspiration approach is used to remove the blood clot. O other times, it's a stent retriever, which is to de delivered through a microcatheter, and that microcatheter is less than a half a millimeter in diameter. So it's it's a tiny, tiny catheter um, to, to cross cross the clot, and inside that catheter, um, the, the stent or stent retriever is called the Imbotrap. It, it has to it's it's made from a nitinol material, which is super elastic. It has to collapse down inside that very small microcatheter, and then it's it's unsheathed. The microcatheter is unsheathed. The the embotrap opens up inside the blood vessel, and 
the, the, the architecture, the structure of the Embotrop is really designed to in, engage the blood clot and, and remove it as, as efficiently as possible for, from the blood vessel simply by pulling back on, on the shaft. And um, the goal is to remove the blood clot, you know, ideally in, in a single pass and take, take it from the vessel. Um, but, but it's... An- I was going to say, that's... That, that's, that, that's- that's really just mind blowing to uh, when you talk about half a millimeter. I think uh, most of the world, most people in other parts of the world who, who listen to that, who hear that, are just just amazed at that. So let me translate half a millimeter into for the Americans here. <laughs> the, a dime is roughly one millimeter thick. So if you think about it as half the thickness of a dime, that's sort of the size we're talking about here. It's tiny, and you know the the engineer in me loves loves this aspect of it, Bill, because I think most people are familiar with coronary stents. It's it's become obviously the a widespread treatment for treating coronary arteries, but but actually the vessels that go into the brain that they wrap down into about half the diameter of coronary stent. So you know it's really really pushing the boundaries of technology to try and. You know, t- take something that needs to collapse down into that small of a catheter, and the processing of these materials. We're using the, the most modern lasers in the world to try and um, cut complex patterns into these tiny nitinol tubes, which are, are, are kind of formed into these intricate shapes, and and all of this designed to to, to remove blood clot. So. It is really, you know, from an engineering perspective, it's 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 a really really fascinating area to, to be working in as well. Exactly, and on top of that, it's really for the physicians ultimately uh, important that these devices are safe to use. And if you consider those blood vessels of the of the heart, the coronaries that Mike alluded to, and you compare them to the blood vessels of the brain, those in the brain are surrounded by fluid most of the time and in the heart they are sur- surrounded by uh, muscles and real strong tissue and uh, that means that any device that we put up in the brain has to be softer and more conformable to the vessel wall than devices that we can use in the heart so that means that a company like Cyranovus that's totally focused on brain treatments has a totally different platform than the cardiology-based devices that uh, that are used in coronary artery strokes. Yeah, absolutely. And the precision there, and you talk about safety. I mean, because one of the last, last thing you want when you're trying to remove a clot from an ischemic stroke is to have a device that is not designed well and ends up clipping the edge of the blood vessel and converting it into a hemorrhagic stroke. Exactly. And especially if the patient also received clot busting medication, then the hemorrhage is almost always lethal because then it's difficult to get to get the blood clotting again and it will just keep on leaking until there's no room and that's a big problem in a skull that's a confined environment so indeed you want to be as safe as possible to do this kind of treatments and still as effective as possible so when we when we look at patients and we look at the outcome of patient we always talk about the mrs core which is how well does a patient do after a treatment. But as radiologists or neurointerventionists who do this treatment, we look at the images as well, and we want to see in those tiny vessels how well did we recanalize that. Did we get all the clot out and uh, how effective were we at that? And especially if you see the more distal vessels, so more downstream, they get smaller and smaller up to a point where it's almost impossible to go there with the device. So, and you want to go as far as possible to get all the clot out uh, that you can get out. But yeah, there is a balance there. Absolutely. Now, when we talk about the technology, I mean, you're both in, in Western Europe and Michael in, in Galway. I didn't even know there was a biotech landscape in Galway. And I think that is just amazing. And I'd, I'd love to get over to Ireland one of these days. Beyond that, and here I am in the United States. And even within these communities in the United States, there are large disparities in stroke care, in the availability of the suites to do the mechanical thrombectomies and other things like that. 
last year I talked with uh, Dr. Dilip Yavagal, who is doing a lot of work on the mechanical thrombectomy 2020 plus plan program to spread mechanical thrombectomy around the world to lesser developed nations as well. How is uh, Seranovis working to address some of these disparities in the availability of mechanical thrombectomy and stroke care? Uh, that's a that's a very nice question, Bill. You already mentioned uh, MT twenty twenty uh, mechanical thrombectomy twenty twenty. This this is an is- initiative by the Society of Vascular Interventional Neurology, and Sierra Novus is uh, indeed supporting them with an, in a number of ways. Obviously, uh, there's um, there's financial sponsoring, but. We also work with a, a, a series of partners to raise patient awareness for stroke symptoms. Uh, we support legislation for stroke patients. Uh, we uh, try to improve access to care in countries without health insurance. So that's uh, that's the thing that we try to partner up with uh, MT2020 because for Sierra Novus, that's that's very important too. Recently, we did a meta-analysis into the disparity of care that is uh, happening in the U.S. And what you do see, there is a disparity in a number of ways. Uh, So um, the minority groups have a problem because when they get to the hospital, then sometimes they cannot get the best treatment for them. Another problem is that the minority groups sometimes cannot get the best care simply because the disease itself is not recognized and they do not go to the hospital. And then the third one is that the minority societies may have problems because their lifestyle uh, gives them a high preponderance to to get a stroke. And these uh, disparities that are happening in the U.S. is also something that uh, Seranova's brought to light and is trying to um, uh, to address in the future. And then f- furthermore, we are working in the U.S. with the Get Ahead of Stroke uh, initiative, which uh, uh, is working towards uh, awareness and policy change for stroke and to make it more accessible for, uh, for others. There's lots of disparities we're seeing in uh, care uh, among different uh, D- different uh, racial groups within the U.S. and different economic groups within the U.S. and different regional groups within the U.S. I had a great conversation uh, last year with Dr. Remley Crow, uh, who has been focused on e- emergency medical services and popularizing the uh, Spanish equivalent of "be fast," which is "ahora," a h o r a, for uh, Spanish speakers, and uh, we'll include some links to that in the show notes. And that brings us to our hack of the week. We've got a couple of them this week, but first, let's talk about sponsor Modus Nova. The Modus Hand and Modus Foot are AI-controlled, air-powered robotic exoskeletons that can help stroke survivors recover the use of an affected hand or foot. The user wears the device while playing video games and getting in the hundreds and thousands of reps they need to drive neuroplastic change in the brain also known as stroke recovery. The leaderboard and scoring system means that you can see your progress happen over time. The software keeps getting upgraded, too, with new games and options. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of an affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash modus nova. Use promo code strokecast for 10% off your first month. And now back to our hack or hacks of the week. Uh, I honestly think that tips and hacks should count for life with and without disability, since um, I think each of us has to deal with your own burdens in life, whatever that burden might be. So what I would say is basically set achievable goals that you enjoy, love the people around you, enjoy the beautiful things in life that people take for granted, such as an uh, occasional smile in the street or a nice piece of music. I think that's what gets people through life, and uh, I think that is the best tip you can give anyone who is alive and wants to stay alive uh, in the best quality. I I thought a lot about this question because I thought it was such a difficult question, Uh, and then Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, I know a lot of people with disabilities around me, not only due to stroke, and then I thought, yeah, it's, uh, it's probably the lesson that I tried to give my kids when they were young. Uh, And uh, I think it works. (laughs) 
That's great. One of the tricks I learned is to brush your teeth with your eyes closed, and that helps develop your proprioceptors and, and improve your balance. But I find it works for, for knee re- rehabilitation. If folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? So we um, have a Saranovus website. It's in J and J Medical Devices. Uh, the the Saranovus website. We also have a LinkedIn page. Um, it's LinkedIn forest slash company forest slash Saranovus, and we also have a Twitter feed. So, you know, we we publish our activity pretty regularly on that, and um, obviously people can can contact the company through those channels as well. Great. And we'll have all those links in the show notes in the app you're listening to, uh, as well as over at strokecast.com. So, Michael and Patrick, thank you so much for joining me uh, today. This has been this has been fascinating. I could just I could just go on and on here. (laughs) That's why we continue with our work. (laughs) Great conversation. Yeah. And lots more to do and learn as well. Absolutely. Let's talk about sponsor like minded. Like-Minded is a nonprofit membership program that helps you live your best post-stroke life. Like-Minded offers classes on everything from hand exercises to telling your story. The virtual classes are led by survivors, OTs, PTs, doctors, SLPs, and more. They're held throughout the week, but if you can't attend the one you want, it's okay because members get access to the recorded version of the sessions so you can still catch up. If you have a specific question, reach out through the private text messaging group that's a part of the program. Get the support you need and deserve to live your best post-stroke life. To find out if like-minded is right for you, visit strokecast.com slash like-minded. Use promo code strokecast to save 20% on your first month. So this week's episode was kind of a deep dive into the biology. I haven't given too much thought to just what really ultimately happened to that clot in my brain. I had just assumed it had eventually broken down and gone on its way to its post-clot life, whatever that is, restoring blood flow through what would then be a field of dead brain tissue. It's fascinating to me to learn that it likely never went away. It just became part of a permanently blocked blood vessel. In other news, I shared my story recently on the Mead Musings podcast. We talked about not only stroke, but also, of course, high blood pressure and sleep apnea. My sleep apnea likely contributed to the high blood pressure that ultimately led to my stroke. It's also the reason why I was sleep deprived for probably 30 years or so. You can hear that discussion at strokecast.com slash Mead Musings. The link will also be in the show notes, and you can even just play the episode from strokecast.com slash clots. Finally, I just got back from the Joko Cruise in the Caribbean. It's an annual event for nerds, geeks, creators, board gamers, and genre fans of every type. In 2020, we were actually the last cruise on the ship, the Holland America New Amsterdam, before COVID just close down the cruise industry. It's always a powerful experience going on Joko Cruise, and I'm still sort of sorting through all of my feelings and ideas from this year. I do want to talk about the big question, though. Given the fact that we are still in a pandemic, was this a good idea? Well, for me, it's safe to say it was. Up until five weeks or so before the cruise, it was still up in the air as to whether or not it would actually happen. Uh, As the infection spikes from Omicron in the U.S. began to decline, it became safer and became more likely that it would be okay to go. So in order to make it safe, we had a lot of strong protections on board. So we weren't just relying on declining numbers across the country. First, everyone had to be fully vaccinated against COVID before getting on board, and there were no exceptions to that. Second, everyone had to test negative for COVID in a medically supervised test within two days before sailing. 
And that was an interesting thing. It was basically the same type of home test I've used before, but in my case, it was on a webinar with a a a, a series of technicians or doctors who watched through the webcam as I did my swab and put it in the little uh, cardboard detector and then held the camera on that for the next 15 minutes or so to get my official clearance. So that was yet another layer. Additionally, everyone also had to test negative again at the port. And I believe this was actually a a rapid PCR test they did. Finally, unless you were eating or drinking at the time or in your stateroom, if you were in an indoor space on the ship or a crowded outdoor space, you had to wear a suitable mask. And they even provided additional N95 masks to further ensure safety. So key thing is the safety protocols work. And I had a great time. If you'd like to learn more about the cruise or consider going next year, you can learn a lot more and and visit jococruise.com. I know I've already booked for 2023, and I hope to see you on the boat, too. To learn more about Sarah Novus, Michael, and Patrick, head on over to strokecast.com slash clots. Share this episode with someone you know by giving them the link strokecast.com slash clots. Be sure to subscribe to the Strokecast newsletter at strokecast.com slash news. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.